The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. While no Canadian teams are playing in the Stanley Cup Finals, plenty of Canadian players, of course, are. And one Canadian who's very much involved right now in calling those games is Hockey Night in Canada Punjabi's Harnarayan Singh. He's with us tonight on that and his new memoir. Also, we'll find out why a rural immigration initiative is actually thriving in the COVID-19 era. And from a September surge to the potential for post-election chaos in the U.S., we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, September 25th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. Hockey is Canada's game. It has been said a million times, but somehow it seems even more true after reading the story of our next guest. Harnarayan Singh is co-host and play-by-play -play announcer on Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi and Sportsnet. He is also now author of One Game at a Time, My Journey from Small Town Alberta to Hockey's Biggest Stage. And it's a pleasure to welcome him to our airwaves from Chestermere, Alberta. Harnarayan, how are you doing? It's so good to meet you. Thanks so much. Uh, doing well. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Well, we're not going to pussyfoot around here. We're going to cut to the chase right away, okay? We are going to start with the moment that made you a hero in Pittsburgh and a viral sensation around the hockey world, and it's all because of a goal scored by a penguin by the name of Nick Bonino. Roll it, please, Sheldon. <laughs> That is awesome. What what impact did that moment eventually have on your life? Yes, it was tremendous. Uh, I really think that, you know, in Canada, we had made grounds uh, where hockey fans already knew about us because the Hockey Night Punjabi has been around since 2008 and the show has improved and grown since then. Uh, but for us to make inroads in the in the greater hockey world, especially down south in the States, uh, the Benino call was huge for us. I mean, they used it as a part of the NHL awards. There we were at the parade after in front of uh, 400,000 people. Uh, you know, the Stanley Cups presented, the players are right there, and then right after it's it's us broadcasters. So uh, such a, a revolutionary moment for our show to, to bring it to the forefront as to what we were about and what we were doing. I, I got that. Hang on, stand by. Sheldon, we got the Stanley Cup parade standing by in Pittsburgh. Let's roll that one too. Benino, 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 Nick Benino! <laughs> and the guys, the Penguins behind are, are loving every second of this. Here's the thing I want to know, though. No one's ever called a goal like that before. I mean, we were all brought up with Foster Hewitt, he shoots, he scores. That's it. Where did the inspiration or the idea come from to repeat this guy's name that many times and have your voice break just on the last one in such a perfect way? Where did that come from? Well, you know, it was a mistake that became a blessing in disguise where in my pregame notes I had written Nick Benino's name for left wing, center and right wing. And there it was in front of me, Benino, Benino, Benino. And that was stuck in my head. My colleagues noticed it. I actually didn't even notice the mistake. And I get into this in the book how there was actually multiple Benino calls because uh, prior to that one in the Stanley Cup final, when I actually had made the mistake, it, it had such we had such a cult following between in Pittsburgh with Penguins fans, and they were demanding more Benino calls. And in the Stanley Cup final, he scores such a big goal. And uh, what an amazing experience! Because you know, having Mario Lemieux come up and say that we're a part of Pittsburgh Penguins history, and instead of just shaking my hand, giving me a hug, and I've become friends with Nick Benino himself, and he said thanks for making me famous, and uh, it just uh, an incredible bond that Benino and I will have for for the rest of our careers. How did, I want to take you back now, how, how did the decision get made to originally start doing Hockey Night in Canada games in Punjabi to begin with? 
Well, this is something where the credit has to go to CBC Sports as in 2008 and during that time frame, they were trying to do some uh, multicultural endeavors where they tried uh, broadcasting Hockey Night in Canada in different languages. They tried Cantonese, ma uh, Mandarin, Italian, and Nuktatuk. Uh, and then Mark Crawford, the coach of uh, the Vancouver Canucks, who was uh, just finished there and went on to be a color commentator for a little bit with CBC Sports, he also suggested uh, to Joel Darling, a, a, a TV executive, still with Hockey Night in Canada, that if you're trying other languages, you have to try Punjabi because uh, Mark Crawford as a coach in Vancouver was experiencing the love that the Punjabi community has for hockey, the passion they have firsthand when he was pumping gas at the gas station, whether, when he was getting groceries, uh, when he was with his kids at a track and field event in the lower mainland of BC, he said Punjabi families were continuously coming up to him. They always knew about the game and they're playing a lot of ball hockey in the streets of Surrey. And, you know, we see that also in Brampton, Ontario, uh, places with the uh, high density of South Asians. And so th that's what kind of started. And I I think it was probably just going to be a pilot project but because the ratings the success and uh the way it made uh you know the it, the community so proud it just it's continued on and we're 13 seasons in now really proud to say that well that's what makes the story so interesting is that all the other languages were tried but didn't really catch on punjabi was tried and it sure did catch on any theories as to why i think the community is really uh proud of uh you know the achievements that they've made and i think it really validated uh the community as canadian the, the my own great grandfather came here over 100 years ago there's been so many hardships that the community has, has had to face and so many uh you know rights that they the right to vote the right to buy land there's so much history in it and then to and now we see uh you know Sikhs as a part of um, the uh, political world, the business world, and then to have, uh, the, you know, the Punjabi language, part of the, the Sikh faith to be a part of uh, the hockey world, it was just tremendous. The other aspect of it is that uh, the Olympic sport of field hockey was very popular in Punjab uh, during a certain time frame where they won several gold medals in, uh, con in consecutive Olympic games. So field hockey was something the older generation of Punjabis were already familiar with. Hmm. I, I, I will want to talk about more of that history of your own family and your relationship with the, with the community in a bit. But, but I am intrigued as well, and you talk about this in the book, you know, Punjabi and, and hockey, how do I put this? I mean, they don't necessarily go together. There's a lot of terms in hockey for which, you know, Punjabi just doesn't, as many other languages, they just don't really have words for those things. So you had to make up a bunch of things. Can you share some of that with us? Yeah, some of the penalties in the hockey world and some of the plays that are made and the existing phrases just simply do not translate over very nicely. So, you know, you have things like hooking and high sticking. And, and so we've had to keep some of those, but we've also created different terms too. So, for example, the penalty box in English, uh, we refer to it as sajada dabba, which translates back into English as box of punishment or we have a slap shot which is a literal slap to the face and we call it chaper shot and you know the community has fallen in love with all of these terms we created our own he shoots he scores maria shot keep that goal and we we include a lot of punjabi flavor we we i would like to say that we add the masala the spices to the <laughs> hockey commentary and the community is very vibrant the personality is you know they love to laugh they love their music they love their food and we incorporate all of that uh, into our uh, game and the community has really uh, you know they've really appreciated that. Now we're going to do this next part carefully Harna Ryan because I understand there are some words in the hockey vocabulary that are very similar to words in Punjabi but which may not be appropriate for family television. You want to share some of those? <laughs> well Yes, uh, I mean, uh, there is a, there's a certain word uh, I believe you're getting at in terms of the, uh, let's say here, New York Rangers uh, legendary goaltender, King Hendrik Lundqvist, and a certain part of his last name uh, translates into a part of... Uh, 
uh, a, a male's body. So let's just say, you know, um, uh, to go about it carefully here. Yeah, there are some times I think initially on the show, especially, you know, when we were calling the games in Punjabi, we would kind of look at each other when we we're <laughs> saying those names because it's just almost a high school giddiness feeling when you're first doing that. Uh, but yeah, it, it is kind of one of those humorous things which doesn't translate over too well. So we've, we, I prefer to call him in English. They do call Henrik Lundqvist, uh, King Henrik, so I converted that to Raja Henrik for a, for a Punjabi call. <laughs> Good thinking. Okay. Um, I've read the book, so I know the answer to this next question, but, but those watching us right now may not. So uh, let's go down this road here. There are going to be people uh, who are aware of your situation and maybe who are watching right now who are going to think, this guy's wearing a turban. Shouldn't he be a cricket fan? Shouldn't he be a soccer fan? Why is he a hockey fan? Hockey and Sikhism don't seem to like they don't seem to jive. Okay, what's the answer? Well, the answer is, is uh, when you're born and raised in Canada, you have a natural affection and a natural attraction towards the game of hockey. And for my situation, growing up in a small town in southern Alberta, hockey was the icebreaker between my classmates and I. And I, and I would tell you, Steve, that my my entire childhood of growing up in a small town in southern Alberta would have been completely and drastically different had it not been for the game of hockey. Because I showed up at school, uh, you know, in a town in a school with very few visible minorities, no one else wearing a turban. I didn't even have other uh, boys and girls from the Sikh faith to have an example of as to what they wore at school to cover their head. And I just had my dad, so I showed up with a formal uh, adult turban on in kindergarten. And there's so much curiosity. And uh, the curiosity is, well, you know, why do you wear that? Uh, you know, why are you vegetarian? As a Sikh, I wear a steel bracelet on my arm to remember the creator at all times. And, uh, you know, we spoke a different language at home. We ate different food at home. So you're, as a child, you're trying to find commonality between your classmates. And when I reflect back on my journey, uh, so many of my friendships and the rapport I had with teachers had to do with hockey. And I think when we talk, sports has that unifying force that when, when you talk about sports, if you're cheering on for the Toronto Maple Leafs, it doesn't matter uh, what background you're from or what, how you look, everybody can cheer on for that same team together. And, and so I think hockey, that unifying force that hockey especially has in Canada, it changed my life. Well, hockey's a unifying force on a good day, but not every day is a good day in Canada. And I wonder, well, I don't wonder because I know there were times in your past where, for example, people would look at you and, and say, you know, hockey's our game, it's not your game. Or what are you wearing that thing on your head for? How much have you had to de deal with that kind of thing? You know, it's it's an interesting question because initially, of course, I did have to deal with that. And, you know, even before I became a broadcaster, when I would uh, attend NHL games, uh, I was, you know, my my friends and I, other uh, Sikh gentlemen who were, wear turbans, we experienced even, you know, my wife and her family had beer thrown at them. Uh, I've been called raghead. I've been called Taliban. Uh, I, you know, I've experienced a number of different racist, uh, racist moments uh, within the hockey world. But then, of course, when we dove into the broadcast side of things, um, there were there have been comments on social media, especially of I don't want my hockey being given to me from a guy with a turban. It took us a, a number of years to explain why you know this is important that we're helping grow the game uh that you know representation is important and that uh what we are bringing to the sport is of so much tremendous value and something that hockey really needs and i think we made a lot of progress but then in the past few years things have uh, come out again where especially on social media where we're seeing more and more uh, comments about uh, you know, why why this is happening and how, you know, we should actually just shut up and talk about hockey. There's so, it seems like a, a lot of kind of this ignorance, for lack of a better term, has crept back in into what we're seeing from people. Well, I mean, we are at a particular moment of racial reckoning in the history of North America, to be sure. And uh, I'd be very interested in your take on what, on what it means to someone who has had to deal with what you have had to deal with in your life. Share some of that, if you would. Definitely. And, and you know, I think it's very important for us to have these conversations. And I, recently, the comments that have been made have been, you know, please shut up. Not even please. It's just literally shut up and talk about hockey. I don't want to be hearing this when I'm 
watching sports. But what I will say is that, you know, we are, by having these conversations, we are not marrying politics with sports. We are literally just talking about human rights and a basic level respect for one another. And I think those are important enough things that we need to have these conversations. Had, had the NHL not postponed their games, had the NBA players not taken a stand, uh, so many households in North America wouldn't be having these conversations. The sports world, the players, the teams, and now the leagues have forced this conversation into people's homes. And it's an important one for us to have because the only way we can progress as society is if we communicate with one, one another what our experiences are. If I have someone coming up to me um, unintentionally just, you know, talking to me. And I had this happen too, where we had a salesperson come to our door. I talk about this story in the book and, you know, they did their spiel and I said, thanks, but no thanks. And then they just said, welcome to Canada. I just wanted to say, welcome to Canada. And they walked off. And, and so for me, that was devastating because I'm such a patriotic Canadian. I love this country. I love this game, but I don't want someone to think that just because I look different, just because I'm not Caucasian, that means I'm new here. But my parents came here in the 60s. My great-grandfather came here in the early 1900s. My history and my family's history with Canada might even be greater and stronger than the person who is making that assumption and saying it to me. But the only way we can have progress is if we share these types of stories with one another. Why do you love Canada so much when on some days of the week, Canada doesn't seem to love you that much? Well, I would uh, say that that experience, thankfully, has been in the in the minority of all of the experiences I've had. I, I love Canada because this is the only country, in my opinion, in the world where someone like myself would have had this type of opportunity to uh, become a hockey commentator. Steve, I had so many people when I was a child, when I went through school, even in post-secondary, tell me that, and these were professionals, these were teachers, and they cautioned me that, Harner Ryan, you need to be realistic. Uh, you know, you should think about a career where you actually have a realistic chance. And they were, it was a cautionary tale that I heard over and over again. And even within the broadcast world, it was, uh, maybe you should think about producing or behind the scenes or if you had a shot on the air, it might be news, but certainly not sports. And, but it is still this country of Canada that gave me this opportunity. And, you know, for the most part, the hockey world, the media portion of the hockey world, the managers at, at these TV stations, radio stations, they have welcomed me with open arms because I, I think they really feel that they realize that this is needed in Canada. My small town of Brooks, Alberta, it was it was a town of much, you know, not very much diversity, but they gave me a glimmer of hope by giving me a shot on the air for high school news and sports and opened the door. And, you know, these were all uh, Caucasian people working there, but I that, that was the light bulb and that gave me the encouragement that if these guys can give me a shot, then maybe someone else will down the road. So I'm, I'm forever grateful for Canada because I think these opportunities only exist here in comparison to anywhere else in the world. Gotcha. Let me ask you about how well, in your view, uh, professional hockey has dealt with this moment of racial reckoning that we're in. Uh, I don't think it would surprise anybody to hear that the National Basketball Association was really at the forefront of dealing with the issues that we're all embroiled in right now. Um, not surprising, because it's, it's obviously a league uh, whose players are overwhelmingly uh, black men. Uh, hockey is really quite the opposite. There are, of course, players of color in the NHL, but they're not very many. In your view, as you look at it, comparing basketball to hockey, to football, to soccer, to baseball, how well or poorly has the NHL done in, in making its contribution to this moment in history? I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the fact that hockey is, as a sport at the professional level, much less diverse. And so, as they say, better late than never. I think this is a, an awakening for the rest of the players, though, in the league, whereas you would certainly see, uh, you know, diverse broadcasters like myself, my team with Hockey Night Punjabi, or you would see diverse NHL players previously stand up and take a stand, make a statement. But I think what has happened recently is, is that this awakening awakening uh, has shown the rest of the players that it, despite them not being a person of color they also need to take a stand on this that this is important enough and I'll tell you what gives me hope it's the fact that teams and the league are now taking a stand they feel this is so important and they are doing that at, 
at the risk of losing and alienating a certain part of their fan base who doesn't want to hear any of this. And we've seen reports of certain teams in the United States who've come out and said we're losing season t- ticket holders because we are taking the stand on this as a league and as a team and, and our players are participating in this, but they're still willing to take that stand. And that's what gives me hope because we need the teams, the players, the leagues as a whole and as an entity to be able to tackle this and to ensure that we can have more uh, compassion in society and that we can have less hatred. And so that's what gives me hope that we are actually taking a step in the direction, in the right direction. The NHL having Kim Davis, a black woman who has done so much for diversity and inclusion at the forefront, that's helping accelerate the process in hockey as well. I want to ask you a question now about your wife. You have undoubtedly, like you've got the best wife in the world, right? And (laughs) here's why I say this. Sheldon, bring up picture number three, if you would. How great is this? This is your wedding, which takes place in a hockey arena. And that wedding cake is, of course, the Stanley Cup. How did you find a woman who would agree to all of this? (laughs) <laughs> I'm very extremely grateful and lucky and you know her creativity knows no bounds um, you know even the the home office I'm sitting in this is all her design and it's an entire wall of uh, the journey of my career thus far and yes our Stanley Cup wedding cake was a life-size Stanley Cup and uh, people wanted to touch it and not just eat it and we had mini hockey sticks uh, with our names and the date of our wedding engraved for all the kids we had hockey pucks we had hockey cards of ourselves we had a 50 50 ticket and half the money went to charity just like everything you could imagine that would happen at a hockey game we even sent steve some of our elders some of our relatives on both sides to the penalty box and uh you know it was it was a hilarious moment i talk about in the book we had a musical chairs game um my side of the family so many aunts and uncles ended up in the penalty box and the mc said well what's going on and my uncle from california said well it's okay we don't care about winning this game we won yesterday we got the girl and and so um, I'm so uh, thankful to have Suki in my life especially since as a broadcaster hitting averaging 75 80 flights a year and now we've got two kids and you know she takes it all in stride and supports me uh, to to no limit and and it's incredible to have a life partner uh, that supports you in such a unique uh, career where I've been you know, on a roller coaster and trying to make this full time and trying to uh, find my my ground in the industry. So it's been a long journey and she's been there from day one. That's terrific. And, and the journey, we should remind everybody, the journey started very modestly. I mean, at the beginning, I, you had to pay your own expenses, your own airfare, all of that kind of stuff just to participate. Is that right? Yeah, and my parents, uh, you know, my mom especially kept telling me that when Hockey Night Punjabi started, that this is a sur- this is a service to our community, and she goes, just do whatever it takes, even if you have to pay for your own flights to be a part of it. Someday it'll pay off. And so the show at the in the first three four seasons was based in Toronto. I was living in Calgary. Didn't make sense for me to move out to Toronto with the cost of living for one day of work, uh, which at the time, you know, we weren't making too much at all. And I don't blame any for this because uh, you know when CBC Sports Hockey Night in Canada told me they didn't have the budget to fly me in and out every weekend uh, I, and you know I understood that but I wasn't going to say that okay well that's too bad I can't I can't be a part of it I just decided to do whatever it took and so that Pearson International Airport during those years I knew every inch of that place as to you know where were the best benches to sleep and where were the best bathrooms the best place to have a snack I, I spent I used to sleep there overnight and to take their latest flight into Toronto, the earliest flight back home in Calgary, go straight to the temple, the Gurdwara, to be with my family on Sunday because I was worried if I gave up my faith, this dream that came true might disappear too. And so it was a, it was a fascinating time. I lost a lot of sleep, but I, I, I also gained a lot of air miles. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Um, let's finish up on this. You've had a, a, also an unusual connection with your province in Alberta in as much as as you grew up near Calgary, but you're a massive fan of Wayne Gretzky and the Edmonton Oilers. So I'm not sure how that, I don't know how that would have gone down well in Calgary. But anyway, you somehow managed to get through all that. And then all these years later, you are doing the broadcasting, but you also work part-time with the Flames now, do you not? 
And let me clarify, massive fan of the Oilers has changed from my childhood to now being a massive fan of Canadian teams because that's uh, that's really what matters at the end of the day for our broadcast, for the show. And, uh, you know, I want to see all the Canadian teams succeed. But uh, the Flames, I, I have to give them so much credit because of the fact that uh, there is a segment, a weekly segment called Flames TV Punjabi, and they were the first team, and I pitched this to several of them, and they were the first team to realize that, you know, this was something that's important and it, it's going to help grow their fan base. And we have a, a sick parade, and I know people in Ontario are familiar with these because there's a number of them that happen around the occasion of Vasaki in April and May. And I've been able to have the Calgary Flames participate in two of the Vasaki uh, Nagarkirtans, the, the sick parades in Calgary too. And, uh, you know, when you have 30, 40,000 people there, the Flames, it, it makes sense to have a presence. And But of course, Wayne Gretzky, uh, I would say that his my favorite characteristic of his on and off the ice is his, his humility. He broke all Gordie Howe's records, but he gave Gordie Howe so much respect and, and, you know, always gave credit to his teammates. The way Gretzky carries himself is something that I tried to apply to my life to carry myself in that sort of same manner and same regard. Well, Gretzky, no question, was a pioneer in hockey. And I have to say, my friend, so are you. Uh, congratulations on the book, One Game at a Time, Harnarayan Singh, Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi, and Sportsnet. And it's been a great pleasure having you on TVO tonight. Be well. Thank you so much. Newcomers to Canada often know the big cities, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. But a new federal immigration pilot program aims to expand that list and help settle people in some lesser-known rural and northern destinations. Ashley Okwosa is an assistant editor at TVO.org and the newest member of our digital team, and she's been looking into how it works. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, so you looked into some programs that help encourage newcomers settle into rural and northern parts of Ontario. What can you tell us about those programs? So I looked mostly at the Rural Employment Initiative, which actually helps um, permanent residents living in the GTA move to rural communities if they're interested. And I did make mention of the Rural Northern Immigration Pilot, which is a relatively new program. It's a federal immigration program. And that actually offers a path to citizenship, uh, not citizenship, permanent residency, rather, for individuals who are willing to move to some of these communities. So I guess the real difference really is that one actually targets individuals who are already permanent residents. And the second program actually offers a path to permanent residency for individuals who are not permanent residents. Now you wrote about a family that uh, moved from Mississauga to Sault Ste. Marie. Tell me about uh, their journey there. So I interviewed Manikata and Shandas Karan, who moved from Bangalore to Mississauga. He moved to Mississauga mainly because he had friends and family and thought that it would kind of be a really great place to raise his family. He has over a decade worth of experience in automotive industries, his wife in HR, and we have two kids. And he started looking for job opportunities. It was a little difficult at first. Um, he was able to find something working as a project manager, but I think he quickly realized that um, you know, in order to afford the life that he had hoped for his family, he probably wouldn't be able to do that on the salary that he was getting in a city like Mississauga. So he reached out to the Newcomer Center of Peel, which is actually the organization that implements this rural employment initiative. And they kind of began the process of looking for different opportunities. And he settled on Sault Ste. Marie, and he's living there happily, you know, with his family right now. So, of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And, uh, you know, for newcomers adjusting to new cities, that can already be a challenge. How does the added extra pressure of uh, a pandemic change things for newcomers? So I will speak directly to the case of Manikatan, but I think for him, you know, he was already considering the move before the pandemic. And I think that what um, the pandemic did was it kind of just made the decision a little bit more apparent for him because he was looking at, you know, Last time I checked, about 3,000 confirmed cases in Mississauga and about 31 in the Algoma district. So I think it just kind of made the decision a little bit easier for him. And he just felt like his family would be safer in Sault Ste. Marie than the Now, something in your article that you talk about is this concept of social capital. Uh, for our viewers who aren't familiar, what is that? And uh, how did that play into kind of the decisions for him and his family? So I think for him, social capital, not just for him, um, but, you know, the definition, um, according to just my reporting, is that social capital is really friendship, it's community, it's kind of being able to find people who you have coffee with or people with whom you have a shared sense of identity or understanding. And I think it just kind of makes the transition to a new place easier. So like I mentioned, Monacotan decided to sort of, you know, move to Mississauga at first, and that's because he had friends and he had family and he had people with whom he shared 
you know, a culture with. So I think that that definitely helped make the transition to a new country very much easier for him. Now, we've done a number of stories about uh, resettling in the north. Um, I had done a story about a Syrian family that moved to Sault Ste. Marie. Um, in a lot of these programs that we talk about, they don't really last that long. Um, you know, some of these programs last a couple months, maybe sometimes a year or so. Um, what else is needed to help newcomers adjust uh, even after the programs are done? You know, I think that, uh, you know, in the story, there was, um, you know, a community that also created this local immigration partnership and they had settlement programs. So what they did is they would actually help newcomers, you know, help their children enroll in school and help them find, find housing, which is great. But another aspect is that, you know, someone that I spoke to said that programs only go so far, which I think is really important. Um, and I think that the real defining thing in helping people feel like they're part of the community is really, you know, the... Um, feeling welcomed by other residents, right? So that's kind of the most substantial thing when it comes to people moving to a new community and feeling like they really belong there. I'm curious, the family's been there since March. Uh, how, how much do they love it? He said that he, you know, he really loves it. It's so interesting because he said that his, um, you know, he lived in Bangalore before, really big city, and he said that his idea of Canada was actually, you know, somewhere very peaceful and very quiet, which mm -hmm. is more like Sault Ste. Marie, the Mississauga. So I think it's, he's, you know, he said it met all his needs and knew in every way. And I think him and his family are really enjoying it. Thank you so much, Ashley. That's Ashley Okwosa. Uh, her article can be read on tvo.org. Thank you again. Thank you so much. When Bill Davis championed the idea of an educational broadcaster for Ontario 50 years ago, he most certainly could not have anticipated the myriad programs and platforms that would flow from it. This Sunday, it'll be half a century of TVO on air, which also became online and now on podcast. To that end, we thought we'd catch up with Katie O'Connor, who is now senior producer for podcasts for all of TVO. And Katie, I guess we should describe you for those who know, you are my boss on the On Poly podcast and other people's bosses on other podcasts as well. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, at home as we all are right mm -hmm. now. And uh, yeah, no, I'm, do I'm doing all right. Who came up with the uh, very brilliant idea about doing a podcast on the 50 year history of TVO? I can't remember. Well, it might have been some guy named Steve Haken. Really? Was I it? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. What an inspired idea. Well, tell us all about yeah. it, Katie. How's this going to roll out? Uh, so, as you know, and uh, other people might not, but it's TVO's 50th anniversary. Uh, 50 years ago this Sunday, September 27th, TVO uh, first came on the air. And so uh, you had the great idea to go back and explore some of the more memorable moments. Uh, and it's been really interesting, you know, uh, researching this podcast. I've been at TVO for about six years now, which, you know, is a very small fraction of time in, in 50 years. And so it's really interesting to go back and learn uh, all about the shows that I grew up up with you know shows like today's special polka dot door um all of the tvo kids shows it's really interesting to also learn about the context that tvo was created in which is something that we explore in our very first episode which comes out this sunday on the anniversary uh you know, looking back at the sort of fight that Bill Davis had to go through, um, you know, the premier at the time to go or sorry, education minister at the time, uh, to go through and uh, you know fight for the creation of TVO. Uh, you know, we talk about there was this really sort of anti-television thing going on back then, anti-technology. And so he really had to push and, you know, prove to people that, uh, you know, this educational television wasn't going to take away from teachers' jobs and wasn't going to, you know, make children into a bunch of, you know, dummies or whatever. <laughs> so it was really interesting to, you know, go back and learn about all of that context. No, it's true. There were a bunch of opposition members at the time who said, wait a second, it'll be cheaper and easier if we just, all the shows you want to do, Mr. Davis, just put them on video cassette and mail them to all the teachers across the province. He, I think, had a view of the future that may have been a little superior to those. And here we are 50 years later. So I guess his view has been vindicated. Exactly. Well, tell me, I, I understand you want to throw to a little piece of tape here. I don't know what this is, but maybe you can set it up. Yeah, so uh, this is something that I uncovered uh, when I was going through the archives. And this is a little piece of tape of your very first time on TVO. Uh, is during a telethon, and it's you being introduced by Elwi Yost. Uh-oh. Do I want to see this? 
Yeah, I think you do. <laughs> okay. You want to say Sheldon, roll it, or should I? Sheldon, let's roll it. <laughs> okay. I'm delighted, completely delighted to welcome Steve Pakin to his first appearance on TVO. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's been worth we, waiting for. Ah, we wish you many, many happy decades ahead. Who let that guy with that mullet on television? I will never know. Well, I feel like the hair's improved, but you, you are you like a vampire or something? Because you don't really look that much different. And how long ago was that? Katie, that, that's 28 years ago. And, and trust me, I'm 40 pounds heavier today than I am back then. So yeah, look, I mean, look how that suit jacket is hanging off me now. Now I can barely get the button done up in the front. Anyway, you're kind to say so, but all right, enough about that. Tell me something, and I, I should say, you know, the late El Yost, absolutely iconic figure, and we do uh, do an episode, of course, on Saturday Night at the Movies for our podcast, because he was just, he was, the, I mean, he was the best. That's all there is to it. Uh, other podcasts on TVO that you might want to uh, tell the good folks about, what else you got? Well, another one that involves a person named Steve Pakin is uh, <laughs> the On Play podcast, uh, which you, of course, co-host with uh, John Michael McGrath, who is uh, one of our excellent writers at TVO.org. And we have been back full time with that now for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we didn't really take too much of a break. We normally do that over the summer. But because of everything happening with going on at Queen's Park and happening with COVID-19, we kind of kept the podcast going. Uh, so we're now coming out every week on Tuesdays. And we've got a lot of really interesting stuff coming up. In particular, we have an interview with Heidi Turek that's going to be uh, dropping this Tuesday. And she is a professor at the University of British Columbia. Now, she has studied science communication. And in particular, she studied countries that are doing communicating really effectively during COVID-19. She also compares British Columbia and Ontario and the communication strategies that they're employing. And we talk about why shaming doesn't she believes shaming doesn't really necessarily work, which is sort of the tack that Premier Doug Ford has been taking uh, recently. And, you know, it will be a particularly interesting episode in light of the fact that the province yesterday just announced that they are changing some of the testing criteria uh, for asymptomatic people. So we'll we'll talk about that as well. Good. we got about a minute left here. Let's see if we can do two more questions. Colin Ellis's On Docs, that podcast all about documentaries. Is that happening still? It is. Uh, films are still happening, you know, even though people aren't really going to theaters. There's a lot of great documentaries coming out. One of the ones that we highlight in particular, uh, Colin does an interview with Michelle Latimer, who is the director of An Inconvenient Indian. Now, you might recognize that name. It's the uh, title of the book by Thomas King, and she has done a documentary uh, framed around that book, and it's a really fascinating look at the history of Indigenous and First Nations people, um, sort of through the mind of Thomas King. It's a, a great interview, and that'll be dropping uh, in October. Okay, and just finally, of course, a lot of attention south of the border, the Republican Party in particular coming in for pretty strong scrutiny right now. Um, the word Republican, what do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so Republican is one of the words that will be featured in the uh, upcoming season of Word Bomb, which drops in two weeks. And it's a will be coming out in time for the U.S. presidential election. Uh, we'll also look at organic and the word sex and the word canceled. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming up, and uh, I hope people will give it a listen. And if they want to find all of our past podcasts, they are all at tvo.org slash podcasts, or you can find us wherever you get your podcast feed from, feeds from. Fantastic. So TVO at 50, on Polly, on Docs, Word Bomb. We got it happening yes. here. Good stuff. Yeah, lots of great stuff. Katie O'Connor, great to see you again. And of course, I will uh, be seeing you again soon when we record our next episode of the On Poly podcast. So you be well. Yep. See you then. You be well too. The agenda this week examined what's behind the September surge in COVID-19 cases and the prospects for getting a vaccine here in Canada. The agenda's week in review begins south of the border and why post-election chaos might really matter north of the border. I am going to say openly, I think the likelihood of civil war in the United States is very low. Janice Stein is from Missouri on this. In other words, <laughs> show me. Okay, Stephen Marsh, show her. 
Well, I mean, I think it depends what you mean by civil war, right? I mean, when I wrote the article for The Walrus that this book is based on in 2018, even coming up with the argument that America was in civil strife was hard to make. Um, but I think we're obviously there now. There are roving battles on the streets of major American cities. Um, you know, I think the civil war that we're talking about is not really armed encampments, but really uh, the breakdown of society, things like what we've seen in the Middle East in places like Syria and Libya and so on. And that seems to me much more likely. I mean, the, the book that I'm working on deals with sort of deep models. Um, when you see things like what's happened in the Supreme Court right now, where essentially the legal system of the United States is now a partisan spoil for party politics, that is classic uh, pr prelude to civil war. Um, when you see things like, you know, the best available models show us that there's going to be about 13 million climate change refugees within the next 20 years in America, you know, that's not a million years away, that's in our lifetimes. Uh, when you see uh, the rise of the far right in the United States, which is totally un underrated, uh, you know, the, like the violence that we're seeing in Oregon, the violence that we're seeing on the streets, which is basically left-wing violence, is, is really going to be nothing uh, compared to when the armed militias uh, really start to make themselves felt, which, which they haven't yet. So, you know, I don't want to be alarmist, but on the other hand, I think that when you talk to the experts at PRIO, when you talk to uh, the hyper-partisanship experts, effective partisanship, what you're seeing here is a very classic spiral where the system of government no longer is legitimate to people, the legal system is no longer legitimate to people, and violence, you know, violence and chaos are the inevitable result. And I think, um, you know, not to not to put too fine a point on it, but this isn't a prediction anymore. We're this is in progress. This is not an incipient thing. This is this is happening right now. Wesley Work, you get to break the tie. <laughs> I think I'm leaning more actually in in uh, Janice's camp on this. I mean, everybody is is right to be worried. Uh, about what the next steps in American politics uh, might uh, might hold, both for the United States and for the world. But I think everything depends on, on an issue that we need to focus on, which is the question of the conduct of the American presidential election and the question of whether or not the outcome will, seem as will, will be seen as legitimate, both within the United States and in the international system. And I think we all have to hope that that a, a path to legitimacy will be found um, and, and the election will be accepted no matter who wins. But if that if we descend into a, a period where there's widespread disbelief in the outcome uh, of the election, that could be, but I say just could be, that could be the trigger for, for some outbreaks of violence and certainly for longer term instability. But I think the key question is, what is the election going to look like, and is it going to be perceived as, as legitimate? Well, you ask what the election is going to look like. I want to know more, and Stephen, I'll come back to you on this. I want to know more about what a civil war is going to look like, because, you know, 150 years ago, it was a northern army versus a southern army, and a half a million mm -hmm. people were dead four years later, five years later. You know, it's hard to imagine that's what it would look like today. There, there is oh, no, no, no southern army. So tell us no. what it looks like in your view. It looks like arms insurgents. It looks like pockets of militias, which already exist. The three percenters, uh, you know, sovereign citizens alone, like the the the, the people, the minimum number of sovereign citizens in the United States are 600,000 people. So that dwarfs anything in the 60s, right? Like we're, I, I think that the far right in the United States is a huge pop part of the population, and they're extremely armed, and they are extremely uh, filled with righteousness. And what, what we'll see is, you know, exactly what you see in Syria where, well, not exactly, of course, but like when I imagine it, it's not armed encampments, it's just the breakdown into tiny pockets of little loyalties, which were already there. Right? Well, we're, let me go to like, Janice. That's, Stein that's on already that. happening. Okay, let the, me go the to Janice. The question is when the larger structures, but like the question is about this election is well, if it fails. But you know, the larger trend is that all the institutions in the United States are becoming illegitimate to the people. Like it doesn't matter what happens with the Supreme Court in you know in horse race politics for now. Half of the country, one way or the other, is going to feel that the Supreme Court is just a bunch of partisan hacks. Once that happens. 
you know, the, the, you lose stability. Like stability is gone. Where are these new cases, to the best of your knowledge, coming from? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question. So locally, which I think we are very similar to other jurisdictions, what you'll see is that it's young adults. So they have currently in our area twice the rate, those between 20 and 39 of any other age group. And actually within that, we also see that it's about predominantly being driven by males. So we're a university town in Guelph, and I'm sure that other university towns are also seeing this. But young adults are predominantly the newest cases that we're seeing. Dr. Lowe, what would you add to that? You know, I would I would agree it is young adults, uh, and certainly in our region, we're also seeing 60% of our cases, uh, people aged between 20 and 49. Uh, in general, what we find in our region is that uh, these are not only uh, the social gatherings, which uh, certainly have been made uh, highlighted uh, in uh, in a lot of the recent communications, but it's a bit of a cycle uh, between what we're seeing in workplace outbreaks, uh, and then these individuals then bring it home with them, and then out and about when they're socializing, and then back into the workplace. So it's this general cycle that we keep seeing uh, between these three settings uh, where we're really focusing all of our, all of our efforts on the surge at this time. Hmm. Dr. Furness, take us back to a, an earlier time when we were doing better and we were seeing for a time, you know, about 100 cases a day. What were we doing so well back then that apparently we're not doing as well today to keep the numbers low back then? The number one thing I land on is actually weather. We can get away with a lot when the weather is hot and it's humid. Those are very protective. That's starting to disappear. So that's number one. But I think number two is toward the end of the summer, a lot of folks throwing up their hands and feeling frustrated and feeling lonely and looking at the low case numbers and saying, I'm going to hug my friends. I'm going to have the party. I'm going to do that because it's been too long. And that's understandable, although, of course, it comes with the consequence that we're seeing. So uh, fair to say it was inevitable as the weather got colder that even if we just kept doing the same stuff, it was going to get worse. Of course, the weather hasn't really gotten colder yet, just a little bit. But every drop in temperature, we could expect, according to some models, a 3% increase in cases. So as the temperature continues to drop, my concern is obviously we're going to see more and more. Hmm. Dr. Lowe, do you know, is this the so-called second wave everybody has been anticipating? You know, I think it's really challenging, and I can only really speak to the numbers we're seeing in Peel. Um, but it also uh, is important to know where the cases are. Uh, and in Peel, uh, fortunately, at the end of our investigations and our contact tracing, uh, we're figuring out about 80 to 85 percent of uh, these cases they have a known exposure. So um, it, it's a little different than a second wave where we would see widespread propagated community transmission. Uh, at this time, most of the new cases, even though the numbers are high in Peel, uh, are people that are connected to known exposures in workplaces, social gatherings, and in homes as well. Well, let me put this in a bit of an odd way for, for you, Dr. Mercer. Are, are, are you glad you're not the Medical Officer of Health in Peel or Toronto right now, where the biggest outbreaks seem to be? Um, well, I would agree, although Dufferin County is right beside uh, the region of Peel, so we are seeing, and in fact, this past weekend, that's where most of our cases were being driven. And of course, because we are um, colleagues, um, we are also supporting the region of Peel with their cases. Very glad to hear that. Uh, Dr. Furness, what about you on this issue of whether we're seeing a second wave yet right now? We only ever know in hindsight when we look back and see when the wave began. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think Dr. Lowe nailed it. We're, we know what the pattern is there. It doesn't look like it's accelerating in the community to the extent that I might use the word second wave. Remember, in June and into July, we had 400 cases a day or so, and it stayed pretty stable. It was frustrating at that level, but it, it showed us that that can happen and that may be what's happening now. My concern is when the temperature really drops. So I think we're, we're we're not seeing the spike that, to me, that says second wave yet. Nicola Mercer, let's go over what we now know compared to what we knew in the spring when this thing first hit. What do you know about how the virus works today versus six months ago? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think what we didn't realize early on, we thought of it more of as a respiratory virus only. And what we are learning is that this is really actually a multi-organ virus, uh, which is why when we see people in a hospital, we're seeing a little bit of a different trend. We also know that when people recover from this virus, uh, different from perhaps other coronaviruses that we've seen, is that some of them actually have a very long period of recovery with prolonged symptoms afterwards. So this was something that we actually didn't know 
about this virus. And I would say the other thing that we're learning is that this is really about human-human interaction and less about fomites or what we, by that we mean what we touch. So it's less about the things that we're around and more around the people that we're around. So all of that time we spent uh, washing off our mail and, and you know being careful not to touch countertops and that, that was probably exaggerated. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, those are important things to do for a lot of reasons about keeping your hands clean. But what really is important, it's those human to human interactions and less about the paper that we touch and the things that we touch. So those are still important. And I'm not saying that you can't get COVID from those things, but really people are getting COVID from each other. Hmm. Let me just start by reading an excerpt from Foreign Affairs magazine that'll get us off to the races here with our discussion. Sheldon, if you would, the graphic. That sort of vaccine nationalism, or a my country first approach to allocation, will have profound and far-reaching consequences. Without global coordination, countries may bid against one another, driving up the price of vaccines and related materials. Desperate governments may also strike short-term deals for vaccines with adverse consequences for their long-term economic, diplomatic and strategic interests. The result will be not only needless economic and humanitarian hardship, but also intense resentment against vaccine hoarding countries, which will imperil the kind of international cooperation that will be necessary to tackle future outbreaks, not to mention other pressing challenges such as climate change and nuclear proliferation. Okay, let's get into this. Is geopolitical cooperation as important, Dr. Bernstein, in your view, as acquiring the vaccine itself? Uh, the short answer is yes, Steve. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical that uh, we work together, we being the nations of the world, the community of nations, because this virus knows no borders. Uh, so uh, if we're going to defeat the pandemic and the virus, we all need to be working together. Jason, what say you on that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, it's been said many times before that uh, the pandemic doesn't end here until it ends everywhere. Uh, and certainly speaking from the perspective of uh, an international medical humanitarian organization uh, that responds to uh, conflicts around the world and, and provides medical assistance to people who are affected by conflict, natural disasters, disease epidemics, and, and uh, other emergencies, we're absolutely uh, concerned about how uh, the people that we provide care for are going to be able to access this vaccine and it's essential that they do. Alex, what are you finding in your reporting on this? You know, I think it's worth uh, acknowledging that uh, the argument for, for working together and for global collaboration is absolutely something that resonates with readers. Um, I've heard this quite a bit from people I've spoken to, that they're very proud of the role that Canada plays on the global stage. Um, but at the same time, I think it's worth acknowledging um, that Canada is, is kind of in a tricky position here. Um, we've heard from officials as well that they really value working together. We feel a sense of obligation to the global community. Um, but while there's been kind of some movements toward a global a global uh, collaboration, the COVAX facility, um, obviously being the big example, um, some big players are not participating. The U.S. obviously made headlines, uh, you know, with that decision. And so we're seeing a lot of countries, um, you know, making it very clear that they're putting money into this, but the fruits of that are for their citizens alone. And so in that context, I think Canada really is trying to sit on the fence a little bit. Um, they're saying we value this global collaboration, um, but at the same time, they're really you know hedging their bets and making sure we lock down um, some agreements of our own. Well, uh, okay, let me follow up with Alan on that. I mean, I, I, th I think it's fair to say the United States has been out there much more aggressively and more, and I think earlier than Canada, in signing bilateral deals with various pharma companies to get something going mm -hmm. here. How how does that affect Canada's efforts to get a vaccine for our citizens in this country? Oh, well, I think we've done quite well, actually. In fact, the latest announcement was just yesterday when Minister Land announced that Canada had purchased uh, vaccines from Sanofi Pasteur GSK, a partnership between those two companies. Uh, and prior to that, she had announced uh, four different vaccines all of which we had been recommended by us at the Vaccine Task Force. So I, I think we have secured um, what we were trying to do at the task force, which is vaccine candidates that represent the different platform. Because at the end of the day, we don't know which vaccine is going to work. And we don't know which platform is going to work and also be uh, safe. So we now have secured a lot of doses uh, from the three different platforms that everybody wants. So I think we're doing quite well. Alex, I wonder if you could tell us about something called the COVAX, C-O-V-A-X initiative. What is that? 
Definitely. So COVAX is really kind of the big global effort to try to get um, countries to come to the same table, table uh, and work together in terms of uh, vaccine, uh, both procurement and distribution. Uh, and so we know as of Monday that Canada is in. Um, so we're going to be part of this, uh, this move to kind of pool money, invest in a slate of, of vaccine candidates, and then in the hopes that one or several actually work out, um, those eventual doses uh, will be shared among the member countries. So it is a move towards the global community working together. Um, but critically, there's a second piece of this. Um, it's called the COVAX um, AMC, uh, or Advanced Market Commitment, and it's the fundraising arm um, that would raise money to make sure that countries that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, like Canada, are also able to participate in this. So I think it's going to be really critical um, to watch not only um, uh, the fact that Canada is participating in this, but whether or not we're going to step up and fund that move um, to make sure that countries that can afford it also have a seat at the table. My understanding is that conversation is ongoing. Um, we could expect news um, relatively shortly, um, but that's something definitely for Canadians to watch. And that's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including those conversations in full, you can always visit our website. That's tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed. That's twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, September 25th, 2020. As we mentioned earlier, it was 50 years ago this Sunday that TVO first went live. So, happy birthday, TVO. We've got lots on air and online to celebrate. And if you are Twitter inclined, please join us using the hashtag TVO50 this weekend. Now, next week, we'll look at algorithmic policing, whether COVID-19 is really prompting city flight, and how citizens can help fortify democracy. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.